Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here, the first on the great panel. Probably I'll take charge to make sure that he, your lunch is well digested by listening to me. And this afternoon I'll talk to you about translation of the, of the drug policies into practice. And I'll talk to you about the comprehensive intervention for people who use drugs, particularly who inject drugs. And I'll share with you our experience in Tanzania about the methadone program and the needle syringe program for drug users. I am a medical personnel. I work as introduced, work in the methadone clinic, but I'm also a psychiatrist and mental health specialist, and I also uh, lecturing the Muimbili University in Tanzania. So I'll just take you through, if time allows me, why did we start the methadone program and needle syringe program in Tanzania? Who are the key players? Uh, what are the implementation plan for methadone and the needle syringe program? I will share with you some data in terms of the current progress, the challenges we faced during the implementation plan, as well as the way forward from now. <coughs> Um, coming from one of the sub-Saharan Africa, I hope you can see where Tanzania is. Oh, sorry, it's the technology. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, yeah, it is there. All right. Sometimes they do not follow command, and they do the other way around. It's a country of about 45 uh, population, and as it is for other countries, majority are, are children. And in Tanzania, the HIV prevalence in the general population is around 5.1%. So why did we start methadone program and needle syringe program? Basically, we had a huge problem of heroin injection use. I know that we have been talking about uh, use of drugs, marijuana, and other drugs. But in Eastern Africa, I hope my colleagues will also agree with me, we have a huge problem of heroin use. But the worst part of it is the injection practice that is highly associated with the number of complications that include the high rate of tuberculosis because of their living environment, sexually transmitted infection. Most women are involved in commercial sex works in order to get money for drugs. And also the heroin overdose, family disintegration, psychiatric disorders, there is also associated with increased rate of criminality and incarceration. And all this data we got uh, around 2000, when we did the first uh, uh, research in the country, which involved the five zones, and that's where we found that there is a huge problem. Initially, people did not believe that this is our problem. We thought injection drug use is not our problem, it's somewhere, somewhere else a problem, maybe in UK, I mean, in US or in Europe, but not our problem. We had to live with that fact when we kept on uh, digging more details about the drug users. That's the time when we realized that uh, this drug using behavior is not only associated with the criminality and the other consequences, but also it was highly associated with HIV and the hepatitis among people who are using drugs. And we knew that this was highly linked with uh, sexual risk behaviors as well as increased risk for sharing injection equipment. And on top of that, we had survey uh, in 2003 which showed that almost all women who injected heroin, they were sharing the injection equipment. And 20% of men, they did the same. And this was one of the highest risk for the HIV infection and hepatitis inspection, particularly hepatitis C, which is more virulent in the uh, blood bone. But in Eastern Africa, there is another practice which is new but very dangerous. People share blood. Uh, immediately after injection of heroin, someone will draw blood from a person of just injection in order to feel high. And you can imagine uh, injection of uh, blood from one person, it means 100% chances of getting HIV and bloodborne infection. If you further look at the, at the data that we, we, are able, we continued to, to work on this one, 2060, we noted that 42% of people injected the drugs, they were HIV positive. And this HIV positivity was very high amongst women to the tune of 62%, while at that particular point in time, the average HIV infection on the general population was only 7%. And further 2011, we did another study, and it kept on telling us that the problem is increasing. 
to the extent that the HIV prevalence among people who are injecting drugs, uh, they were 51%. And the rate was very high among women. This was around 72% amongst women who are injecting drugs to HIV positive. And in that survey, we did also check for hepatitis C. And what we found, again, was really very amazing, uh, 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 very scaring in a sense that more than 75% of people who injected drugs, they were also infected with hepatitis C infection. And the rate was even higher among women to the tune of 84%. So, these are the data which that we found. And we kept on asking ourselves why women are more affected than men. Is it because women, as they do sex for drugs? Is it because uh, women happen to, uh, uh, women, they, I mean, they sex for money in order to buy drugs? Or it's just a female sex who happen to be a drug user? And at the end of the day, does it matter? Because we knew that this population is bridging, is bridging between uh, general population and this subpopulation which is basically hidden and any fight against HIV and hepatitis if you do not involve this hidden population definitely you will not succeed because there is a pool of HIV and hepatitis plus many other uh, physical conditions like TB and STI which we needed to reach these people and make sure that we treat and for that matter we acknowledge that we needed to work and we needed to work fast and in so doing, we joined our efforts. The Department of Psychiatry and Mental Health, where I'm coming from, is the one which bring this evidence uh, on table, because we are the ones who did these surveys and, and researches and got this data. And together with the Drug Control Commission, which is the body sitting in the Ministry of Health, uh, responsible for controlling drugs in the country, it is an interministerial uh, board, which, is also in, which involves uh, various ministries, the Ministry of Health, the Minister of, uh, I mean, the prison, the police uh, prosecutors and judges, uh, as well as the Minister of Education. We normally all sit together and address issues of the drugs in the country. And on top of that, we have this program that took lead or took charge to provide uh, uh, intervention within the country. But also we got technical assistance from uh, Pangea Global Foundation from USA and the University of Texas as well as working with other local partners and international NGOs like Medicine Di Mondo, who are experienced in providing community-based harm reduction, especially in the syringe program in the country, and also the university and other local NGO partners. So all of us, we sat together and say, what are we going to do about this problem? After uh, knowing that we, we uh, I mean, after planning that we needed to go that one, then we started the process slowly, initially by lobbying and advocacing. The little data that we managed to capture from the previous studies are the ones that we use as a scientific evidence to show that we have a problem and people need to act. If you don't do it now, at the end of the day, you are going to lose the nation. And in that, we also, we, we took the message together with the primary and secondary level of tertiary of prevention. And in primary, we focus more to the education and the public, uh, 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 I mean, to the schools and the public health education about the issues to stop using, um, to stop or not starting to use drugs. For the, for the secondary, we, we, we uh, talk about intervention that were available within the country, as well as providing uh, rehabilitation for people who were affected. But also we had to talk about the, uh, the police, uh, police makers, and also the consensus with the law enforcement, because currently in the country, harm reduction is not acceptable. In a sense that if you are found with any paraphernalia related to drug use, you are liable for punishment in 10 years in jail. So you will not attempt to take a need on syringe to give to a drug user in your attempt to, to, to prevent HIV and hepatitis uh, infection. So the law is still there, but at that point in time, we started to talk and we had a, a mutual agreement between the law enforcement and the We Health Enforcement that let's work together towards the fight against HIV and hepatitis and, hepatitis, and do not fight the drug user. So after, agreement that, after that agreement, that's the time when we moved forward. And now we had it to balance between supply reduction, demand reduction, which is commonly being talked about. But at the same time, we had it to minimize uh, the risk that were associated with use of drugs. 
And for that matter, we were able to establish the National Strategic Framework for HIV Prevention for people who are using drugs. Uh, this is the, is the document that we've been using. It is, it is based on the recommendation made by the UN agencies as it was presented earlier by WHO uh, agent about the nine comprehensive package that should be available for people who are using drugs. So that is the model uh, we are using. And therefore, we develop a number of local documents to make sure that we are, we are well guided through the process. So these are the, some of the documents that we developed to make sure that our services are well provided. Thereafter, we did a number of uh, capacity building. Remember, this was a new uh, problem in the country, and we were not experienced in doing that one. So we had support from various agencies, including UNODC, who uh, chose Tanzania to be part of the Threatnet uh, training plan. And we send our people for training. I was amongst the first batch who were trained. And, and thereafter, we did a lot of training uh, and also trained uh, community outreach workers and involvement of police. We trained the police officers to understand the concept of addiction, to understand that addiction is not always a criminal offense, but people are sick. And because of their sick, they needed to be treated. And once we were, we were understood, we made the renovations of some of the areas. Uh, these are the first and second two methadone clinics. They are based on the government hospitals. The first site is at the National Referral Hospital, where I'm working. The second one is the Municipal Hospital. And these are all uh, public institutions, and the services are within the public services in the Ministry of Health. We established a community outreach strategies because we needed to reach these people. These are the people who will not come forward to seek for, for services, but we are the ones who are going out looking for them where they are and starting to talk about uh, treatment options available. And if they agree, then we give them an escorted referral to the hospital to start uh, treatment. But at the community, we provide a number of services, uh, including uh, uh, income generating activities, schooling, etc. And at the hospital, once they come in, we not only provide the methadone, but we also treat them as a whole. All the problems that they have, tuberculosis, infections, etc., they were treated within the hospital. And all these services were free of charge because it came from the health policy of the country. Addiction and mental health uh, is one of the chronic in illnesses that treatment has to be done. Uh, has, they have to be exempted from uh, paying the services. We also use the mobile clinics to reach out them. This including access to hepatitis and HIV testing counseling. So when you go out with these caravans, we'll have a camp. They'll come, we talk to them, we test HIV hepatitis. For those who are ready to receive treatment, we go with them to the hospital to start the treatment. We are also working with MDM, the Medicine Demondo, who are an who are expert to the needle syringe program in the country. And this is the one of the vans they are using for outreach program. So what have we done so far? We are using the comprehensive provision model, which is WHO recommended and UN agencies, the UN aids, as well as the UNODC. It has got a nine package. I'm glad to announce that Tanzania, currently we are providing almost, almost all the nine packages as recommended by WHO for people who are using drugs. We are using the, uh, the hospital. We are using the dropping in centers at the community levels. We are also using the van to reach out the population and provide these services. With an exception of number nine, which talks about vaccination, diagnosis, and treatment of viral hepatitis, this is the only one we still have uh, challenges. It is the worldwide problem. The only thing we can do now is just to test for hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Otherwise, we, we do need a syringe program. We provide methadone, HIV testing and counseling. We provide AR at the all methadone clinics and other government hospitals. We provide uh, treatment for STI. We have condom programs. We provide uh, targeted materials that uh, talks about uh, use of drugs and the consequences related to use of drugs, as well as tuberculosis, as I will show in some of the data. So we had our first site in February 2011. The second site was opened in a year later, and the third site in the following year. So at least we have three sites. And what have we done so far? We've been able to reach, uh, this is 
Tanzania's prevention program, we've been able to reach about 8,578 individuals. These are people who are drug users, are injection drug users. Who are, these are the men who sex with men and female sex workers who will not easily come forward to seek for services. And these are the people who are hidden. We were able to reach out to them. 22% of these people were injectors and female contributed only about 80%. So we have problems with the females because we see uh, uh, a very minimal number of women when you go out for the outreach. We know the reasons. One is that men, uh, African women, they have responsibilities during daytime. And the majority of women, as I showed earlier, they could be involving in sex work, and the sex work business takes place during the night. So unfortunately, when we do our programming during the daytime, they are probably at home or sleeping. And when you go to sleep, that's the time when they go out, and we kind of don't meet each other most of the time. Uh, by October, I did not update. Uh, I should have said earlier, this, this was my earlier slide. The latest version did not open here. So I'm using the later, I mean the earlier version. We currently have about 1,200 who are on methadone program currently. And all these 1,200 people, they were heroin injectors. We have not yet touched it for those who are smoking or snorting. Only we are focusing for the injectors. Our primary uh, aim was initially to deal with the HIV and hepatitis issues. The women population contributes about only 10%. As I said, it has the same reason. And this table tries to say the distribution, where we have as young as 16 individuals enrolled in the program, and 53 years a person also in the program at enrollment. And I know that this, for, for many people, 16 years is considered as a is under age, but at the end of the day, we say this is not a program, this is intervention, and everybody from zero years to wherever, they deserve to get treatment. Okay, so I might need to jump, but I'm just about to finish. So far, the retention is 80%. That means almost all people who are on prog they're still on program, and 80% are drug-free. They stopped using drugs. For few who stop, continue to use the drugs, uh, majority are still using cannabis. It's, this cannabis has nothing to do with methadone. It's more of behavior, and it's one of the difficult drugs to stop. So we see the trend is just like anywhere else. But uh, for the program, 30% of those who were tested were HIV positive. 32% uh, hepatitis B positive, and 58% uh, uh, were hepatitis C positive. So these are the ones who are on program. And also, we have managed to give 41% of those who deserve to get, uh, of those who are HIV to start on ART. In other language, those who are not initiated ART, their CD4 count is still high, and we are still using uh, 200 as the cutoff point. We have been treated 11% of the population for tuberculosis. This is very high as compared to the general population, where 0.2% of the general population they are treated for TB. But for this population, we found the rate is very high at 11%. We lost two clients after having multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. And this uh, called upon a, a very risky for even health providers, because you do not know who is having multi-drug resistance, et cetera. For, for and for, for MDM, they were able to reach 9,000 people who were using drugs, two-thirds were injectors, and they, they, they are able to reach about 850 using their community outreach workers. They provided 30,000 syringes each month, and also they are able to recruit about 1,500 police officers so that they are sensitized on the issues of harm reduction and give us support and give support to the drug user rather than incarcerating them. There was a number of challenges. Uh, the, the commonest challenges we, are, we had is the misconception that methadone is another addiction and giving needle syringe to people who are using drugs is, will, will, I mean, it, it was interpreted as will encourage people to continue injecting. Although our primary aim was to focus on the prevention of HIV and hepatitis in the community. So we had to have a leverage between this supply reduction and harm reduction uh, problems, where some group consider, think that supply reduction is the answer to the drug use problem. While in the health sector, we think 
both will work and each one has got his own role. Health professionals should play their own and also law enforcement should play their own. But you all need to sit in one table, discuss how are you going to manage that one. Lack of resources, of course, is the cross-cutting issue. For the staff, we find ourselves having a heavy uh, work, which was not there before, and also safety and security uh, of, the, of this program, because you are bringing together a number of people who Unfortunately, they had uh, a number of personality problems. In a survey, we found 77% of them, they had cluster B personality disorder, which includes antisocial personality disorder. So bringing all these people together creates somehow a tension amongst staff and uh, clients themselves. But also the cost of traveling to the clinic is still very expensive. Um, many people live below the poverty line and this is one of the reasons why 20% could not continue being in the program because they, they are not able to, they are not, they are not able to, uh, uh, to, to pay for the, their transport. Otherwise, we think women as one of the areas that needs to be considered. The only thing that I'd like to say, we are moving forward. The government, starting from the president, prime minister, and the member of parliament have basically agreed based on the work that we showed to them, this program works and the government has given direction that from next uh, government year, they are going to finance the program so that you are able now to move throughout the country. And this is just to show the beauty of harm reduction, starting from injection to get married. These are just two examples. Of course, the beauty of Africa will not forget. <laughs> And I'm really very thankful for you listening. And it, as I said, it is a multiple work of many individuals who have been doing work together with us. Thank you for listening. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, let me begin by thanking you uh, very profoundly for hosting us uh, or for having us at this uh, very distinguished gathering. Um, I think uh, the Portuguese-speaking uh, African countries have led the way in, uh, dealing with drugs, uh, in dealing with the drug issue. And we can only hope and pray that um, the English and the French-speaking countries will follow suit so that uh, we can all be at the same wavelength um, in Africa. Um, I want to make a very short presentation uh, on the work that we are doing, basically providing legal aid for drug users in conflict with the law. Um, as the moderator introduced me earlier, my name is Hussein Khalid. I'm the executive director of uh, Haki Africa, but then I also partly lecture at the School of Human Rights and Governance Studies. Um, Haki Africa is a non-governmental organization based in Mombasa. Uh, Mombasa is uh, at the coast of Kenya, and it works basically to promote uh, development and improve livelihoods with a particular emphasis on uh, socioeconomic rights. So the whole idea behind Haki Africa is not to go out and defend people's rights, but rather to build the capacity of the people to be able to champion for their own rights themselves. So we don't expect to be there forever. We want people to take the struggle for their rights on their own so that they can be the champions for their rights. And uh, we do this using various um, means, um, you know, public lectures, talking to communities about their legal rights, their constitutional rights. And of course, sometimes this means going um, out to the streets and demanding for justice. Whenever we feel that uh, you know, um, there has been some form of injustice anywhere, then we do that. Um, what you see in the picture is uh, a public lecture where we had the political leaders um, coming back to the public to explain what they've done in terms of uh, implementing the Constitution. 
And then um, the other side is basically when uh, a few Kenyans were renditioned to a neighboring countries, uh, to a neighboring country to face charges there. And we felt that uh, that was against the constitution. So we took to the streets um, together with the people to demand for justice. Um, Socioeconomic rights in Kenya basically are guaranteed by the Constitution of Kenya. Now, Article 43 of the Constitution of Kenya guarantees uh, these rights, which include the first and the most important one for us, the right to the highest attainable standard of health, which includes the right to healthcare services, including reproductive health care. Now, the Constitution of Kenya, which was uh, recently promulgated, um, makes human rights justiciable which basically means if your rights are not guaranteed or if you don't in one way or another enjoy your rights, you can actually go to court to sue the government for, for not having to enjoy these rights. So this is something very, very crucial, the Article 43, because it is within which the work that we are doing is based on. It is the foundation of the work that we are doing. As you will see later, we have very many disabling laws uh, you know, that would not allow, for example, uh, for drug users um, to get justice in courts or things like that. But through the Article 43, if there's any law, uh, legislation, that contradicts the Constitution, of course, that law is null and void to the extent of that contradiction. So then this article becomes extremely, extremely important um, in the work that we are doing to try and ensure that uh, drug users have their right to health care. Um, besides that, of course, we also have uh, other rights, uh, accessible and adequate housing, uh, freedom from hunger, and to have adequate food of acceptable quality. Again, this is crucial for drug users, not just any food, but adequate food of acceptable quality, clean and safe water in adequate quantities, social security, and education. These are all constitutional guarantees under the Constitution of Kenya. Um, Kenya and uh, the drug use. Well, as is in most other countries, um, it is illegal and punishable by a fine, imprisonment, or both if you're found in use or possession of any drugs in Kenya. And these drugs range, you know, from marijuana, um, heroin, uh, and, and all those. So it is something punishable, and unfortunately in Kenya, um, even though we are neighboring, um, Tanzania, which has made huge strides in terms of dealing with the drug issue uh, from a health perspective, we still lag behind in that, in that area. In Mombasa, where our organization is based at, drug use is the worst in the country. And uh, children as young as nine years old are actually hooked on drugs. Many drug users find themselves in conflict with the law at one point or another and get caught up more often than not um, in the criminal justice system. So, Many of those who use drugs, at one point or another, they will tell you that they've had issues with the, with the police, with the criminal justice system, or something like that. And approximately 70% of the total remand prison population are on drug-related cases. Um, in Kenya, um, the prison population, at the moment, we are housing over 300% of the capacity of our prisons. Our prisons are meant to take in just about 15,000. That's the population that they're supposed to take in. But we have on average 50,000 inmates at any given time in all our prisons. Now, out of these 50,000 inmates, over 50%, just over 50%, around 51 and 52% are on remand. Yeah, these are remand prisoners. Basically, you know, the law says you're innocent until proven guilty. So if your case, you've not been convicted, then you're, a, you're an innocent person, but then we have over 50% of the prison population on remand. And this over 50%, which translates around 26, 27,000 people, 70% of them are you know, on drug-related charges. So that's Kenya um, and the drug use. Oh, sorry. Um, to society, drug use is a criminal issue and not a health condition. That is something that is very common everywhere you go. Unfortunately, we've not been able to change the mindset of our people to start viewing drug issue as a health condition. Of course, uh, political pressure, uh, religious communities, these two are at the forefront of trying to you know, ensure that it remains a criminal issue 
that needs to be addressed by punishment and things like that. Um, so what exactly do we do in as far as uh, legal aid is concerned? One, generally, um, Haki Africa, we provide legal assistance to the public who can walk into our office with their matters and get a lawyer to advise them on matters of the law. We are three lawyers uh, within the office, and at any given point in time, um, at least one lawyer is in the office. So members can actually just walk in with whatever type of case that they have and then seek legal assistance, which of course we will advise and then direct them on the steps they need to take. We also visit justice institutions, including police stations, courts, prisons, and bostels uh, to conduct legal aid clinics. So we don't just wait for clients to come to our offices, but we also organize from time to time with lawyers on pro bono services to visit prisons, to visit courts, uh, police cells where major atrocities occur. In Kenya, uh, people would prefer, uh, and it's a common saying, that you'd rather have your day with a thug than with a police officer. You know, if you're caught up in a dark alley and you're told to choose, whom would you rather uh, see in, in, in that alley, a police officer or a thug? 99% of the people would say, I'd rather take my chances with a thug than the police officer. Yeah? So police stations are, are, are major areas of violations which we also visit. Uh, we also link individuals in conflict with the law, with criminal justice system, with their families and justice actors. So for example, someone is arrested, their family they don't know, and maybe all they need to pay is a small amount of bail for them to be released. Sometimes we have people who would stay in, who would stay in jail for months simply because they cannot communicate to their families. We don't have the mandatory one call. Yeah, I think we see that in the movies in the US, I think, uh, uh, Mr. So we don't have that. So if you don't have a way of communicating, you could actually stay in prison for many months. So we also do that. We link people to their, to their families. And basically what we're trying to do is to narrow the gap between justice actors, government, and communities. In general, by amongst others, providing legal education. I think it's very, very important. Wherever you go, when, when you're in court, we say ignorance is no excuse. Because you don't know the law, you can't go to court and tell the magistrate that I didn't know that that was a crime. That's not an excuse. So what we are doing basically is to go out there to empower the people to understand the law so that they can be you know, key players in the, in the advancement of their rights. Um, that is, again, uh, public education. And we, we very much try to use women leaders in our community forums, because we feel women have a very good understanding of the issues on the ground. Um, specifically for, for drug users, we carry out legal education within communities, in particular within drug joints, yeah, where we know we'll find most of these drug uh, users. We go there purposely to talk to them to under, so that they can understand the law in as far as uh, you know, drug use is concerned, when they are arrested, what can they do? Because in Kenya, it's, uh, like I said earlier, it's very, very strict. You can even be jailed for being in an environment, not for, for using drugs or for being in possession of drugs, but being in an area that is generally perceived to be a drug den. That is a criminal offense in Kenya. So if you're found in an area where usually people uh, uh, use drugs, then that can be a criminal offense and you can be charged in court for being in that place and you can actually be sent to, to jail. So these are some of the issues that we try to bring awareness on so that they can understand. So um, specific emphasis on drug users in conflict with the law because one, we have realized and after participating in a number of forums that punishment of drug users is counterproductive. These people are arrested, they're taken to prison, and in prison, it's even worse. We know that drug use in prisons is rampant. It's not that they're in prison, then they, they will stay away from the communities, they will not have drugs. But drugs are actually present in prisons. We know many drug users who are actually introduced to drugs while they were in prison. Yeah? So punishment of drug users is actually counterproductive. Why do we do this again? Um, to guarantee the right to health, which is a constitutional right. Yeah? So we try to ensure. And that's the basis of human rights, you know. Every person, as long as you fit to be called a human being, you are entitled to certain enjoyments. It doesn't matter whether you are rich, you are poor, you are black, you are fat, you are white. If you are a human being, 
then there are certain entitlements that are owed to you. And that is what we are saying, that the right to health care is a constitutional right. Each and every person, irrespective of their problem, whether they are drug users or not, they are entitled to the right to health care. And that is why we are doing this. Um, dealing with this as, uh, as, I mean, legal aid for drug users also reduces congestion of prisons. Like we said, over 70% of those in remand are on drug-related cases. So if we can be able to release most of these people, then we will decongest our prisons. Not just the prisons, but also police cells, and also the, 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 the courts. We have so many backlog of cases in our country, over 10,000 cases. You can actually go through um, um, a hearing for 10 years. Yeah, I think there was exa an example yesterday by the, the former President Sampaio, who said that uh, someone was arrested and then after he had already moved on is when the sentence was given out. So this is the same in our country. So again, by, by addressing these issues as a health issue, we are able to decongest some of these cases. Um, saves money for both state and non-state actors, of course. Improves family ties. You know, if someone can be assisted to get over the drug use, we just saw the picture um, in Tanzania, the someone who was rehabilitated and was able to take care of their families. Uh, these are some of the reasons why we do what we do. Okay, I have two minutes. I don't know if it's two minutes or 21. Because there's a, uh, why legal aid is crucial in dealing with drug use? Um, one, it safeguards the right of individuals to health care. I think I've, I've explained that. Each and every person, irrespective of who you are, you have the right to health care. And human rights are inherent. They are inborn. No one can take them away from you. So by doing this, we are guaranteeing the right to health care of each and every person. Two, improve social ties and livelihoods for communities. When we are able to get these people from the drug dens to actual you know, meaningful employment, then we are not only contributing to their own well-being, but to the well-being of the community and the nation. And three, we are actually helping the criminal justice system you know, to be able to address some of the difficulties they're experiencing through this. The key steps in legal aid provision amongst drug users Screening, very important. Whenever we get someone, we have to ask him who he is, what problems he's, he's, he's been through, uh, what kind of uh, charges are they facing, and then we trace. We try to find out where the family is, where the lawyer is. Sometimes some of these people come from affluent families, you know, but they are afraid of talking to their families because they feel if they do so, then they will be, you know, an outcast. So we try to talk to their families, we trace them and link them with the relevant authorities. Very, very important to introduce them to treatment. Now, as Haki Africa, we do not at any point in time claim to be experienced in treatment. We don't do that. Basically, what we do is to try and create a conducive environment for healthcare for drug users. So when we encounter some of these individuals who need treatment, then we get in touch with the NGOs and medical practitioners who are experienced in treatment. So even though we are providing legal aid, it can be an entry point to actual treatment because we are in partnership with a number of these institutions. Uh, of course, uh, introduction to treatment and legal assistance and linking with key justice stakeholders. And last but not in, uh, least, secure release and follow up to reduce recidivism. So it's not just about ensuring that person is free, but also ensuring that they don't go back or they don't repeat or they don't fall into the same trap they were in. So maintaining, maintaining contacts. Um, very quickly, the challenges and successes. Um, stigmatization is a major challenge. In Kenya, still, uh, we have a huge problem. Most members of the public do not want to hear anything to do with drug abuse or drug users. They view them very negatively. They view them as outcasts. So this is a huge problem that we are really trying to educate members of the public on, that these are our brothers and sisters. And because the problem is so huge, we cannot run away from it. So stigmatization is a major challenge. Um, disabling laws, uh, like I said earlier, um, just being found in an area uh, you could be arrested, um, holding um, syringes and things like that, just as is the case in Tanzania. If you're found with a syringe, you could actually be taken to court and charged with that. Um, police. Police are a major, major challenge. 
you know, they, they've basically refused to work with, uh, with uh, you know, drug users, and uh, wherever they find them, they mistreat them, you know, torture them, and we have had so many cases of people dying in police cells uh, after undergoing torture of all sorts of kind. So the police remain a major challenge to overcome in Kenya. Um, successes, very quickly, judiciary. Um, um, we're, we're very happy that the judiciary is slowly but surely um, seeing things our way. Uh, we've been able, for example, to communicate with them that uh, you know we need to treat this issue differently as a health issue. And uh, on several occasions, we've been able to win some of these cases. That was one of them, um, one of the drug users who was charged with being in an environment, actually not a drug user, but a healthcare provider who was actually visiting some of uh, his clients and he got arrested for being in that environment. And we were able to go to court and uh, successfully uh, won that case. Um, the prisons are another success. The prisons have already adopted an open door policy and they're allowing us uh, access to visit some of these prisoners and talk to them and address uh, some of the issues that they're experienced with. So prisons have been a key ally in Kenya in terms of uh, dealing with drug use as a health, uh, health issue. Um, very quickly, harm reduction works. I know there are many uh, doubting Thomases out there about harm reduction, whether it really works or whether it makes issues uh, you know, uh, worse. But for us, we have seen it. And trust me, we've seen people's lives changing just from harm reduction. Uh, those two are recovering uh, drug users, and they have gone, they, they underwent, uh, they're still actually undergoing harm reduction, and they're now back with their families and are very productive members of the community. Um, it's not all gloom and sad, of course. Um, if there are any issues uh, we can arrange to meet, that's back home in Mombasa, and uh, we can always have a cup of tea and chat some more by the sea. Thank you very much. Muito obrigado, Dr. Hussein Khalid. Uh, e de seguida, Dr. Idrissa Ba, Comissária do West African Commission on Drugs do Senegal.